we still don't see you know very much innovation and very much product innovation taking in a place in India in this disability space. And sometimes when I talk to investors or businessmen, they say, "Ah, oh, well, you know, that's that's the part of the government." So I just wanted to <laughs> introduce you to uh, uh, Dr. Sinha. Uh, perhaps with uh, just introduce yourself and perhaps also you know take this question with you: Is the government actually promoting innovation in the sector? What is it doing to do that, or is it actually stopping innovation in the sector? Okay. So before I introduce myself, I said I'll answer your question. Yes. Okay. <laughs> So now, Dr. A.K. Sena, Director, uh, Ali Avaja, National Institute for Hearing Handicap. The nodal ministry in India, which deals with the disability sector, is uh, Ministry of Social Justice and Empowerment. Now, it has two departments, one department of social justice and another department of uh, empowerment of persons with disability. Now, as you are talking about innovation, I must appreciate, and you must also appreciate, the first, the name of the department itself is an innovation that it is a department of empowerment of person with disability. Now, if we have to empower person with disability, they need assistive device. Now, these assistive device has to be cost effective, easy to use and availability. We are, as for government of India uh, numbers, if you say, we have uh, 268 million people with disability in India, much more than the population of many of the other countries. And most of them are in rural area. So all our innovations has to be, but with innovation, cost effective, the modern technology is also important. Like for example, I come from the area of hearing disability. So right now, the first time the government of India has come up with a scheme of providing cochlear implant. Cochlear implants are not manufactured in India. In 2004, DRDO started some work and still not, we don't have make in India. So it is all imported. But now government is thinking, can we ask the companies to come here and manufacture and lump sum, let's say 5,000 piece per year, we take it and remaining they can export. Then cost will also go down. So this is also one way of innovation I can say. There are many research facility government has given for innovation. Like our own ministry has a fund for carrying out research with the innovations where a small setup or some small uh, prototype can be made and then it can be taken by any manufacturer. Important point here is that if any of the aids and appliances which is only useful for a person with disability for a small number that does not give you profit in manufacturing. But if you manufacture here and export it out to other countries, then definitely this will become. So yes, we are in innovation okay. and surely with others, we will definitely go ahead. Okay. Can I press you a little bit on this in the sense that, you know, we talk about the Accessible India campaign, we talk about the Smart Cities campaign. I mean, is the government actually sort of promoting innovation as they take out these you know, quite large campaigns. Yeah, uh, this uh, Accessible India campaign was launched from Mumbai only. And it was we only that we started, uh, that it was in September, and then officially it got launched on 3rd of December 2015. That is the International Day for Disabled. Now, cities have been identified, the mobile app is also underway, that the uh, buildings will be made accessible. Now, this same question, just Coming to this place, two days back I have answered on a Prime Minister portal grievances the question which you have asked that if this concept of smart cities are being brought in by the government, will there will be accessibility for person with disability? But then we as a ministry and a government of India, we are not saying that accessible India campaign is only for person with disability. Suppose this hotel is accessible for a wheelchair bound person. It is accessible for a person who is using crutches, accessible for a person who is using hearing aid, accessible for a person who is a pregnant, accessible a person who is having two child on the lap. So accessibility, barrier free concept is not only for disability, it helps everybody. And lastly, I will say, all of us, don't be surprised, we will definitely live with disability at least for last 10 years of our life, if we live for 100 years. 
So whatever we do today for the person with disability, don't think so it is being done for person with disability, it is done for humanity. So from that angle, yes. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Now, uh, I just want to go back to a question that uh, Roberto raised. Um, you know, um, for a large time, uh, the government has been responsible, in a sense, through Alimco as production and through the NGO sector for distribution of, of devices. But still, uh, you know, the actual reach, I mean, 5 to 8 percent of the people who need these devices are actually getting them. So something is going wrong. So Parvati, I just, um, you know, wonder if I could turn to you. I mean, is there a possibility of sort of increasing this 5 to 8 percent up to 40 percent, up to 50 percent? How can we do that? Um, thank you. The, uh, the fact that it's currently reaching 5 to 8 percent um, in many ways is, uh, is a positive because there has been a lot of work that has gone in to be able to reach that. So at that, let's take that as a starting point. How do we get it to 40% market penetration, considering that there are 268 million people in India with different kinds of disabilities? I want to take us back to some of the ground realities in India, which are very important for us to understand if we need to understand distribution of any kind of innovation, but specifically of those that are impacting family members who are not considered productive. Right? Culturally, if you look at rural India, and if we say that a large number of the 268 million are not in urban spaces, they are also living in families that are typically, you know, 50,000 um, rupees a year income to maybe a lakh and a half rupees income. These are families that are subsistence agriculture families. And imagine if a family had five or six members in the family, they have 50,000 to about a lakh to, you know, educate everybody, get everybody through medical, so on and so forth. There is very little money and, uh, and aspiration and, uh, you know, thinking about left for those family members who cannot be generated to the 50,000 or one lakh. It's a very real reality of poor families which we sometimes tend to forget in the, you know, is there a bottom of the pyramid which can buy, right? We forget the reality that there is a certain amount of income that must cover a lot of people. And we understood this particular aspect very sharply when we were doing a research and trying to understand something as simple as reading glasses. Or can, can we increase the penetration of reading glasses? It's such a simple product. It's available off the shelf in any, any departmental store in the US, also in India. But why are so many women, especially women, going blind unnaturally because they don't have the assistive device of uh, you know, a reading glass post 40? It actually is a disabler because it disables them, even from being able to channel the grain that they need to do, right? It is big, and we found very interestingly that it's not that the glasses were not available in the market because entrepreneurs come to the weekly hearts and sell those glasses. But wherever the individual had an income generating role, that person had gone ahead and bought the reading glass. Wherever they considered, the family considered the member to not be income generating, they didn't think that investment was worthwhile. Uh, so it's, we can debate the good and the bad of it, but this is an economic decision. Which means that as innovators of products and solutions in India, if we have to create this penetration that is that deep, we have to create a pull factor. And one of the clearest aspects of doing that is the value proposition. It cannot just be a mobility product. It has to be a mobility product that enables somebody for a livelihood. So what do I mean by that? Agriculture is a large part of what these people are doing. Clearly, this is not the user group that's going to migrate out from Bihar into you know, Delhi or whatever. They are homebound, which means they are working on agriculture. If we could find assistive devices and tell, show them how that assistive device can help them sort their grain a lot better, be productive and therefore be economically viable, the family would invest in it. But that interpretation is a very large interpretation for families to make on their own. So I just wanted to go back to the value proposition for a moment. So innovators cannot just think of product in India. You need to think of the livelihood connect that that particular product is able to bring to the family that you're trying to um, sort of look at. And then we're looking at distribution. So how do we get them out there? Because you know you can't have everybody come to an infrastructure facility to get a prosthetic or so on and so forth huge channels that exist through the post office network, through the branches of the SBI, through, we found the ITIs, which are the polytechnics, which is there in every single district, and so many students go there, are studying things like optometry. But they're not finding any jobs, so they're becoming entrepreneurs. But an optometrist entrepreneur is a very good 
place for us to be able to actually equip them with a few devices that they could sell. Because the entrepreneurs in India are growing and they need livelihood methods to be able to reach out to Mraja markets. So if the innovator can think about not just the product, but also think about what livelihood uh, challenges they are solving and sell it in that manner, and we as a group could fund and innovate to create these interesting distribution mechanisms, there could be a very powerful value proposition in India. And we really could be a, a country which can demonstrate how we can reach these 268 million within the next decade. It doesn't seem very difficult to do if we get this together. So if you entrepreneurs or if you um, investors in entrepreneurs thinking about a product, do it with the blind, with the uh, um, physically disabled, with the deaf together. Nothing about us without us. Thank you. I have a thought to add to yes, that. Uh, I, completely, I completely agree with Sabri on that because I think one of the largest challenges with taking innovations to scale, to getting distribution to the penetration levels that we want, is the challenge that the innovation and the innovator have very often worked in a vacuum. Yeah. So yes, you can do an immersion for a couple of days in a particular area. All of that is good. But an immersive experience in the environment with the people who are co-creating mm -hmm. the solution is a very critical part of that innovation. And it's, and it's very sad that we see a lot of very good quality ideas just fall by the wayside because they are actually critically not usable by the people who need to be using it. Yeah. So just the last thought on that so, before I give it, I'm sorry. <laughs> but the last thought on that is that therefore, if we had to look at the value proposition of something like the Enable Make It Hum, right? right? Uh, is there an immersive process where we actually do it in a rural environment with the local people yes. over there for two months at a time where we are able to then not only just do uh, you know, um, a, a development of an idea, but actually develop it, use it, prototype it, and get the local entrepreneurs there to be able to sell it? Because then we would shift it from innovation to actually solving real problems. I, I think that could be a great thing. I think one of the aspects which came out of the presentation and which is seldom seen outside is that uh, the market for disability devices alone today is about $360 million USD. Nobody sees it that way. Right? So uh, only $40 million worth of devices are being sold today. Okay. And it is growing heavily because of people's uh, longevity increasing. Okay, um, and forty-seven percent of the physical disabilities are due to accidents. We are not getting any safer on our roads in any case, right? So I I think the fact that it is a very large this is only for physical disability devices. We are not talking about hearing aids. We are not talking about. Uh, uh, aids for the visually impaired and so on and so forth, right? Yeah. This is just one disability. And if you look at statistics numbers, it is split as 40, 40 and 20, 40 for locomotive disability, 40 for speech and hearing, and 20 for uh, visual impairment and other developmental disabilities, which is typically about 95% <coughs> falls into these three categories. If you were to do a simple projection, you're talking about a thousand million dollar market. And I, I won't know how many of you look at it as a thousand million dollar market. Can I ask, um, just by a show, show of hands, um, are there any people who, uh, within the sort of corporate sector or startup sector here, um, you know, looking at investment, etc.? Okay, I just wonder where I can turn to you and try and help us from your aspect, from your perspective, sort of answer the question: Why is nobody looking? particularly at investing within the disability sector. What's turning people off? As an entrepreneur developing prosthetic legs or, and cost-effective mobility devices, and now commencing commercialization, I understand that talking to customers, yes, innovation, and as I rightly said, it's important to co-create with the stakeholders. Otherwise, you're really not solving a problem. But at the same time, it is not enough to just create a pertinent uh, technological solution and distribute it. One must also talk about serviceability or repairability of uh, the device because you might be able to corner a person once, but once they buy it and they realize that you know they can't repair it or they can't uh, you know it can't it can't be serviced, then they won't buy it the second time round. So 
just much as it's a technological solution that has to be cost effective, you, you, you must consider the whole cycle. So that is important as a designer to consider is it, you know, yes, uh, it can it be distributed within the existing channels, but also think beyond and look at serviceability too, and that is very important. I think we, we should also um, uh, remember all the things that, are, that were actually made for people with disabilities and who are now common good. For example, we all use the keyboard. What was the pre-invention of the keyboard was the typewriter. Why was the typewriter invented? Because there were blind people who couldn't write. Yeah? And the blind had needed, the educated blind who became blind in the war, they needed a typewriter. Yeah? Or the ball pen was created for the blind also because uh, they would not see whether ink is still um, or coming out of the, you know, uh, um, yeah, um, uh, on, on the paper or not. So, um, so therefore the ball pen was created. So I think we should. Uh, we should remember uh, these inventions and see what actually, what are the ins innovations that we do for people with disabilities that compensate certain needs, which maybe can even have a wider reach for the whole society.